there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Coming up, the finest wine glasses money can buy. The world's slimmest TVs. The deepest swimming pool on the planet. And the source that sells two million bottles a day. How do they do it? Mankind has been knocking back wine from a glass since Roman times. But unlike man, not all wine glasses are created equal. According to the experts, wine tastes different out of different glasses. So you haven't just got to buy expensive wine, you've got to shell out for expensive glasses too. The finest wines demand to be drunk out of crystal glasses. Hand blown, hand crafted, and using methods handed down from generation to generation. How do they do it? Great Torrington in North Devon, England, is the site of the UK's only handmade crystal glass manufacturer. This factory has been producing high-class glass for nearly half a century. Today, the dress code has moved on a bit, but the tools and techniques haven't. The process begins with these sacks of fine silica sand. The sand will be mixed with soda ash and limestone. These three minerals are the main ingredients of most regular glass. Next, they add lead oxide. This is what turns ordinary glass into crystal glass. Adding 24% lead oxide will increase the density of the finished glass. So it bends light passing through it, making it sparkle. A guy dressed like a stormtrooper adds the batch to this furnace. Here, it's heated to around 1,400 degrees Celsius. That's hotter than volcanic lava. But it still takes up to 10 hours to melt the sandy mix. Humans started making glass about 5,000 years ago in ancient Egypt, but it's actually been going on in nature forever. Conditions in volcanoes and lightning strikes can be so intense that they can turn rock into beads of natural glass. The next challenge is turning this superheated soup into crystal clear pieces of glassware. And that's a job for master blowers like Tony Cummings. Tony's team use steel blowpipes to collect a piece of molten glass known as a gob from the furnace. It's almost like a tin of syrup, really. It just, you know, goes onto the pipe as you, as you turn it. The molten glass will become hard within 20 seconds so it's quickly put in this mould. By simultaneously spinning the pipe and blowing into it, Andy Popham transforms the solid gob into a hollow bulb. Mechanical glass blowers do exist, but they couldn't perform work this intricate. This technique's barely changed in 2,000 years. The big difference is that they used to use clay blowpipes and now they use metal ones. And they didn't wear shades. The next job is creating the stem. First, they heat the base, forming a blob of hot glass. Then they clamp it. And the stem puller slowly draws the blob from the spinning glass, creating a thin stem. Then it's passed back to Tony, who reheats the end. Cut a piece of glass off now. Then, that, then we use the foot maker to spin that out. And then we flatten it off. And that's it done, then. From furnace to finished glass, it takes just 73 seconds to handcraft each piece. Working at speed, the team can create over a 1,000 items of glassware every day. And it's all done with moves any choreographer would be proud of. 
It does look quite dangerous, I suppose, to some people. Some people I know have come down here and watched us working, and they're really impressed by the fact that nobody ever gets burnt. Now the glass parts company with the blowpipe, courtesy of a cool, wet knife. The next problem is the jagged rim left at the top of the glass. The solution? The cracking off machine, a lethal merry-go-round for glasses. A tungsten blade scores each glass to its desired height. Then a gas jet heats the weakened line to 1,000 degrees Celsius, scything off the surplus. The machine decapitates 200 glasses every hour, but it still leaves a razor-sharp lip. So more gas jets melt the rims, softening the sharp edges, until they're rounded enough to clamp your kisser on. There's a medical condition called the glass delusion, where people think that they're made out of glass. King Charles VI of France had it. He even put iron rods in his clothes so that he wouldn't break. Unsurprisingly, he was known as Charles the Mad. Every year, the company produces 250,000 crystal clear glasses, ready for the shops. But if you're after something a bit special, engraver Nick Davy is your man. Crystal glass is a pain to engrave. But the results are clear to see. Americans watch nearly 600 billion hours of TV a year. That's like one person watching the box for 66 million years straight. The first working TV was built in 1924 by Scottish engineer John Logie Baird. He used an old hat box and two lenses from a bike light. It wasn't HD ready. These days, TV addicts demand bigger, better sets than ever before. LED TVs. They're super sized, super thin and super complicated to make. How do they do it? Vestal City, Turkey. At over one million square metres, this mega factory is the size of 200 football fields. It specialises in making massive TVs. It sounds crazy, but there was a study that showed that children raised watching black and white TV were more likely to have black and white dreams. Do you reckon the kids of tomorrow will dream in 3D with surround sound? Weirdly, the secret behind supersized screens is tiny. These are strips of light-emitting diodes, or LEDs. This pick-and-place machine installs the LEDs into things called light bars. The challenge is to spread their light across a screen that can be a metre and a half wide. The answer is a transparent plastic known as PMMA, or Perspex. As light is shone through one end, the PMMA structure scatters the beam evenly throughout the sheet. The world's biggest TV is seven and a half metres across. That's 25 feet, or two elephants standing nose to tail and two more elephants standing on top of them. The only problem is, you've got to stand a long ways back to even see it, which kind of defeats the purpose. Back on the production line, a robot places the panel above the light bar, followed by two optic films, which harness the light to make the display brighter and more colourful on the screen. The screen itself is a liquid crystal display, or LCD. LCDs came from carrots. I know, that sounds weird, but one, carrots have got cholesterol in them, true. Two, cholesterol is a liquid crystal. And three, the principle behind LCDs was discovered by someone researching carrots. LCDs came from carrots. True fact. The liquid crystals won't work without any power. The units that distribute that power are made on site by this machine. It builds a kind of mini city, full of roads to run the current along, gates to let it through and towers to regulate it. 
On the next line, workers assemble the motherboard. This is the brain of the TV and controls everything from volume to channel choice. Once they've been checked, the boards can go to the production lines. But they're three kilometres away, on the other side of this massive factory. So they summon the postal robots. These robo-posties aren't scared of dogs, never want to rise, and don't go on strike just before Christmas. The power board and mother board are installed on the mother of all assembly lines. Then the backs go on and the finished sets are sent for a quick colour test. High-definition LCD screens have over 2 million pixels, and each one of those pixels has three sub-pixels, red, green and blue. And amazingly, by mixing just these three colours, a TV can produce over a billion different moving colours. The finished, tested TVs are then packed up by robots. And they're ready to take pride of place in your home. Perfect to settle down and eat in front of. Still to come. A swimming pool so deep you could stand a blue whale in it. And a condiment so popular you could fill 85 Olympic swimming pools a year with it. How do they do it? From here, this might look like your local swimming pool, but dive under the surface and it's like no other swimming pool on Earth. It's 42 metres deep. This pool is insane. It's like a hollowed-out 14-storey building underwater. So when it comes to building and maintaining the world's deepest swimming pool, how do they do it? Monte Grotto Terme, near Padua, northern Italy. Site of the luxury hotel Terme Milipini. 100 rooms, four stars, and one incredible swimming pool. Y40, the deep joy, the deepest swimming pool on Earth. Imagine 23 grown men standing one on top of another. That's how deep it is. You're in trouble if you drop your locker key or sunglasses in this pool. Y40, the deep joy, is shaped like a giant funnel. As you rise out of the central abyss, the pool broadens out into a series of ledges, rock formations and caves. There's even an underwater viewing tunnel, if you don't want to get wet. Architect Emanuele Boaretto designed the pool and the hotel. Ci ha fatto incontrare delle difficoltà tecniche che con grande abilità da parte dei calcolatori, degli ingegneri, siamo riusciti a superare. The first difficulty is heating the pool's 4.3 million litres of water. That's enough to supply a family of four for over 30 years. Since divers spend hours at a time in here, far longer than they dive in the ocean, it needs to be even warmer than a normal swimming pool. Emanuele's solution was to draw on a natural spring, where water has been warmed by volcanic rocks deep beneath the Earth's surface. Constant hot water with Mother Nature picking up the tab. Calda, pura pura. The next problem was keeping this water clean. Every swimmer sheds around 40,000 skin cells and three or four hairs every hour. If a pool gets busy, pretty soon you could build a whole new person. Just not a very hairy one. Cleaning the pool is the job of this huge pump room. Inside these pipes, the water is filtered four times a day using sand. Then they add chlorine and a little bit of acid to kill off any bugs and bacteria. Now it's perfect for free divers like Umberto Pelizzari to practice for an upcoming dive. Umberto Pelizzari is a world record holder. His diving record is for over 150 metres, or 494 feet, without air. Imagine swimming the length of the Statue of Liberty from top to bottom, and you're only a third of the way there. Most freedivers have to train out at sea, 
which is hugely dangerous. This is one of the only places on the planet where they can do it indoors. Another bonus is that there are no sharks knocking about. Umberto prepares for his dive by flooding his body with as much oxygen as possible. This is exactly what whales do before they dive. Some freedivers can also lower their heart rate to the same as a blue whale's, from around 60 to just six beats per minute to help them preserve oxygen. One final gurn and Umberto heads down. As soon as humans enter the water, our blood automatically starts to move from our arms and our legs towards our hearts and our brain, making sure we keep our supply of oxygen going to our most important organs. As he heads deeper and deeper, the increasing water pressure starts to squeeze his lungs. On the deepest dives, they can shrink from the size of a football to the size of a small grapefruit. By the time Umberto touches the bottom, the levels of CO2 in his body have massively increased, and his brain screams at him to breathe in. It's his ability to fight this instinct that means he can hold his breath far longer than you or I. The record for holding a breath underwater is 22 minutes. 22 minutes. That's the length of an entire episode of How Do They Do It? Unlike scuba divers, Umberto isn't taking in air underwater, so there's little risk of bubbles of nitrogen forming in his body as he ascends, the main cause of the bends. At the surface, it's time for one more goldfish impression to purge his body of the carbon dioxide and take in oxygen, so he doesn't black out. Next stop, the ocean. The world eats over 32 million tonnes of ketchup every year. And whatever you like to call it, you'd need a condiment bottle the size of 98 Empire State buildings for all that Tommy K. Over the years, it's had all sorts of names. It's been called Cats Up, Cat Sip, Cots Up, Cotch Up, Corn Chop, and Cut Puck. I prefer brown sauce. This one company sells 650 million bottles and 11 billion sachets of ketchup every year. But only eight people know how to make it. How do they do it? This is the Tomatina Festival in Spain. It started 70 years ago as a spontaneous food fight between kids. Now it's an annual event and a surefire recipe for fun. As long as you're not the one cleaning up when it's over. Afterwards, they scoop the stuff up, add salt, bottle it and sell it to shops. Don't you wish the world really worked like that? Never mind the tomatoes. Early ketchup recipes started with the intestines and bladder of a shark that was left to ferment up to 100 days. I'm slightly relieved that they've moved on from there. To find out how they do it these days, we've come to Elst in the Netherlands, one of the few countries in the world to prefer mayonnaise on their chips to ketchup. So it's a bit strange that this factory is based here. This plant makes around one million bottles of ketchup a day. And they use a lot of tomatoes, which arrive in these huge aluminium bags. Each bag contains almost 250 kilos of paste, extracted from Mediterranean tomatoes, not between the toes of the people of Tomatina. When they finally started using tomatoes to make ketchup in the 19th century, the finished product came out yellow. To turn it red, they added coal tar, which, in big enough quantities, can kill you. They haven't added coal tar for over 100 years. But when we asked to see what does go into their secret recipe, we had the door shut in our face. No, no, I'm dumb here. There's only eight people in the world that know the recipe, and even I don't know the recipe. Yes, we know. <laughs> we know. It's any special recipe. Uh, we can't tell you. <laughs> After an interrogation in a room with a one-way mirror, 
they finally told us that they mix the paste with vinegar, sugar and salt and heat it. Then they send a man in disguise to pick up a blue plastic bag containing the secret blend of herbs and spices and he shakes it into the top of the vat. And that's how you make ketchup. Each batch the company produces is sense checked by super tasters like these guys. When you come in uh, first thing in the morning and you taste ketchup before you have a cup of coffee, then people think it's very, very strange, but um, we're used to it. Experts think that we love ketchup so much because it's one of the few foods that triggers all five of our types of taste buds. Sweet, sour, bitter, salt, and the new one, umami. After tasting, there's one more test that ketchup must pass. In these health and safety conscious times, it was almost inevitable. There's a speed limit on ketchup. In 10 seconds, we can only have 10 centimeters flow of ketchup. That's the 10 centimeter rule. This ensures the ketchup is just the right consistency. This machine's arm is set at the normal pouring angle. Then the boffins time it over 10 centimeters. Okay, here we go. We're not sure what happens to the tomato boffins if the ketchup doesn't pass this test. We just hope they don't get canned. And it's perfect. It only takes eight hours to go from bag of paste to bottling. This brand famously has 57 varieties. But when Henry Hines came up with that slogan in 1896, he was already making more. He just chose 57 because he thought it was a lucky number. And with an $11 billion turnover today, he wasn't wrong. Coming up. Creating a machine that could destroy tower blocks like Godzilla. Crafting jackets fit for heroes brewing one of the world's oldest beers. How do they do it? This is the Rotar Pulverizer. A four and a half ton demolition dinosaur. When it's attached to an excavator, this 360-degree rotating head and jaws can chomp through walls for breakfast, reinforce concrete floors for lunch and steel bars for dinner. If Jurassic Park ever needs a wrecking crew, this is what they turn to. The Tyrannosaurus rex had the most powerful bite of anything that's ever lived. But this thing has put it to shame. It's 30 times more powerful. But creating something tough enough to tackle the daddy of all demolition jobs is the mother of all engineering challenges. How do they do it? Torun in northern Poland. Founded in the 13th century, this beautiful medieval city is now a protected UNESCO World Heritage Site. But not everyone here is into preservation, because this is where some of the toughest wrecking attachments on Earth are built. This morning, designer Joris Justen is finalizing the plans for the huge jaws of the Rotar Demolition Pulverizer. His challenge is to make something that is incredibly strong, but can be wielded with the precision of a surgeon's scalpel. We have to create a clever machine that can demolish everything that it has to. We have to create to destroy. Once he's completed his computer-aided designs, the plans are sent down to the company's massive factory floor. The job of turning Joris's 2D images into 3D lumps of metal falls to Roman Pilewski. To do that, he flips down his mask and fires up this laser cutter over a slab of heat-treated super-strong steel. Using the remotely controlled cutting head, Roman slices through metal like a knife through butter. 
In minutes, he's cut out all the parts the company needs to make the jaws of the pulverizer. The next challenge is welding the lumps together, but in this state, the edges are too rough. So they're handed over to Maché. He uses an acetylene torch, heating the steel to burning point. The burning steel reacts with oxygen to form molten iron oxide, which drips off like wax, leaving a smooth edge. Acetylene burns with a really bright light, which was handy when the first cars arrived because the early electric light bulbs weren't bright enough to be used as headlamps, so they used acetylene instead. This is fine until you hit a pothole because acetylene is explosive. The parts now need to be bent into shape so they can fit together. But bending steel that's this strong takes more than an oversized pair of pliers. It takes this massive mechanical press. Using a foot pedal, Koch Chame Schwab applies 200 tons of force to each part. The finished parts can now be assembled like a giant model dinosaur. Václav employs a powerful magnet and winch to hoist the sections for the pulverizer's lower jaw into place. Next, he temporarily fixes them together using a technique called tack welding. But to survive the immense stresses of demolishing buildings, the two halves need a tougher weld than this. If you weld cold metal, it could crack under pressure. So the jaw is placed in this oven. The door's closed. And it's left to slowly bake for two and a half hours. Once the parts are warm enough, Marcin fully welds the sections together, creating a tough bond that can survive a lifetime of chewing through rubble. But on a demolition site, a tough pair of jaws is useless, unless they can swivel to reach into every corner of an old building. And that's where Robert comes in. He's busy using a robot to weld together something called a subhead. The joint between the monster's neck and jaws. This will allow the pulverizer to rotate 360 degrees, bite down and then rip back with 30 tonnes of force. Can you imagine a T-Rex that can rotate its head through 360 degrees and clamp its jaw down with maximum force in any direction? It's that. The parts can now be assembled under the guidance of veteran engineer Jakub Cherokee. He uses a winch to slide the subhead onto a block holding the lower jaw. Moving jaws this big will take a lot of muscle, and that will be provided by this huge hydraulic cylinder. Once this has been secured, the top jaw is hoisted into position and fixed in place using this massive steel pin. The pulverizer's jaws are now complete. But if you want to chew through a skyscraper for a living, the jaws need a seriously strong set of teeth. These will do nicely. Forged from a custom-made steel alloy, they're three times stronger than normal steel. The trouble is, they'll still need replacing once in a while. So like a transformer's dentures, they're designed to be replaced and secured in seconds using two simple pins. After the jaws have been given a lick of red paint, Václav steps in. Like Dr Frankenstein in dungarees, it's his job to bring the monster to life. Václav attaches hydraulic hoses to the main piston, waits for a lightning bolt, flicks the switch, and it lives. Oh. 
The finished machine is hoisted onto a waiting truck, ready to be sent off around the world. Mounted on an excavator arm, the Pulvasaurus will soon be doing what it does best. Destroying anything in its path. Still to come. Tailoring the jacket worn by Hollywood heroes and flying aces. And making the beer drunk by medieval monks and knights. How do they do it? If you're looking for a classic piece of clothing, you can't beat the flying jacket. Rugged, stylish and manly. And to the airmen of World War II, a lifesaver. The higher you fly, the colder it gets. And cabin temperatures could drop as low as minus 40 degrees. In 1943, high altitude frostbite accounted for more injuries to bomber crews than all other causes combined. To turn a sheep's skin into a jacket fit for a flying ace, you need to be sharp, skillful, and seriously nimble-fingered. How do they do it? This is the Shot Factory in New York. They've been making jackets here for over a century. One of their most famous bits of apparel is the B3 bomber jacket. Essential wear for wartime bomber crews. Since World War II, these jackets have been worn by everyone from Steve McQueen to James Dean and Elvis. Today, production is overseen by third generation company owner and tailor to the stars, Jason Schott. The production methods are virtually the same as they were when this jacket was first created 80 years ago. Like in Grandpappy's day, Jason kicks off the process by inspecting all the skins that come into the factory. They look like normal dyed leather, but they're actually suede, which is the underside of the sheep's skin. Each jacket is made from up to four sheepskins, but no two skins are alike. So Jason has to match ones with similar grains to ensure an even finish. Sheepskin is tough and waterproof on the outside and warm and comfortable on the inside. It also wicks away any moisture from your body. It's hard to find anything that would do the job better, really. The next challenge is slicing the jacket's different sections out of the hides. And that's a job for John Gianfrancesco. I've been kind of sheepskin for shot for 36 years. Sheepskin is expensive, so John needs to arrange the patterns to maximise the amount of material he gets from each hide. It's like a puzzle. You've got to fit them in. John uses a razor blade to slice the skin. The thick fur can play havoc with his straight lines, but John's confident he's got it under control. I know what I'm doing. He presses just enough to slice the leather, but not so much that it tears the wool. So it's gonna be like this. Once John has done his bit, the sections of jacket are handed over to the factory's army of expert sewers. With the precision and rhythm of a drummer band, the guys here sew the sections together, swayed side up. After just a few minutes, the jacket starts to take shape. But this stitching leaves an unsightly seam something you want when you're shelling out over a thousand dollars for a jacket. The answer is strips of goat leather, sliced out by Jason on a kind of 19th century office shredder. Goat skin is soft, flexible and hard wearing, so it's perfect for sewing over the seams to create a smoother finished look. Goat skin's got another useful property. It's very water resistant. Centuries ago, they used it to carry wine around. The next challenge is sewing the belts on. Two by the neck and two around the waist. The final piece of the puzzle is attaching the zipper. Today, we take these for granted, 
But Schott was the very first company to add a zipper to a jacket, all the way back in 1925. The zipper we use today was invented in 1913, but didn't get its catchy name for another 10 years when a boot company added them to their boots. They called them zippers for the sound they make when they zip up. Before the finished jacket can be worn by the next generation of Top Guns, there's one final bit of sewing to be done. We're sewing our name into all of these jackets that we're making, and so there's a responsibility to make sure that they stay up to the quality that my great-grandfather would approve of. By the time the jacket is complete, it's passed through 20 skilled pairs of hands. Now it can hit the shops, ready to turn ordinary Joes into all-American heroes. This is probably the oldest and weirdest beer in the world. Buffett. Brewed since the 1400s, Lambic beer is sour and tart, unlike anything else you've ever tried. That's because the guys who brew it rely on bacteria and yeasts in the air to start the fermentation. This is basically brewing with all of the modern technology taken out. Since medieval times, knights and monks, peasants and kings have drunk this peculiar beer. And it's made using techniques that have barely changed in centuries. How do they brew it? Brussels, Belgium. They've been making beer in these parts for centuries. Today, at the Contillon Brewery, Jean Van Roy continues the family tradition, using the same methods and equipment as his great-grandfather. Lambic brewing hasn't really changed since the Middle Ages. Back then, they didn't know that it was yeast that turns sugar into alcohol. They thought that the whole process must be a miracle. For some, it was proof that there was a god. I think that I agree. Jean kicks off the process by filling a tank, or mash tun, with a mix of 65% malted barley and 35% unmalted raw wheat. Most brewing mash tuns are sterilised stainless steel barrels. This 150-year-old one, home to millions of bacteria and microbes, is most certainly not. Jean stirs in hot water to dissolve the starches locked up inside the grains of wheat and barley. The water is drawn from a 200-year-old boiling kettle. Once the starch is dissolved, enzymes from the malted barley get to work turning it into sugar. We need a specific temperature to extract a maximum of sugar, but it, it takes a lot of time. We need here between 10 and 11 hours to produce, uh, to, to make a brew. Sugar is critical as it's later broken down by the yeast to form alcohol and carbon dioxide. Different enzymes work at different temperatures, so the sugary liquid, known as wort, is heated in stages from 45 to 72 degrees Celsius. So we pump up the liquid with this old pump into the boiling kettle, and this liquid will come back in the mash tun to warm again all the mash. The repeated mashing lasts until Jean decides the liquid has sweetened enough. Most modern beer makers have automated this process. Super brewer Jean relies on tasting his wort to see when it's ready. That's nice. That's sweet enough. Jean then rewards the gang with a little sample of the wort. This half-finished beer tastes like a sweet liquid porridge. Mm -mm. Brussels tea. Jean's next job is to add this sack of dried aged hops to the sweetened brew. Twenty-two kilograms go into every ten thousand liters of wort. Brewers have been using hops for centuries. It's what gives beer and lager its natural flavor, and it's also a natural preservative. 
but before hops, they used to throw in stuff like heather and rosemary and bog myrtle to flavor their beer. The hops steep in the hot wort for three hours, releasing aromatic oils and preservative tannins. No time uh, to filter the hop and to pump up the liquid on the cool ship. The cool ship is this massive copper tray in the rafters of the building, exposed to the Brussels air. This is where the yeast comes in. Incredibly, the air we breathe has millions of spores of yeast in it, and Lambic brewers rely on it to ferment their beer. And even more remarkably, it's only the wild yeast found in this part of Belgium that will do. So you can't make Lambic beer anywhere else in the world. Thanks to these wild yeasts, hundreds of flavours have been detected in Lambic beer, including ones that smell exactly like leather, straw, cheese, soap, mould, earth, vinegar, spice, vanilla, caramel, chocolate, butterscotch, honey, sulphur and sweat. There's nothing quite like it. However, the air also contains airborne bacteria, which could infect the beer. So they have to wait for winter to ferment the brew. Only when the temperature drops and the bacteria become inactive is it safe to make lambic beer. Once the wort has been inoculated and allowed to cool, it needs to be stored and aged. But with lambic beer, modern stainless steel kegs won't do. We need contact with the air. The lambic is a, an oxidized beer. Jean's solution is to pour his beer into these ancient oak and chestnut wine barrels, which allow a bit of air in. Most beers ferment in just a few days. Lambic needs up to three years before all the sugars are turned to alcohol. As if it doesn't evaporate away first. We lose a part of the, the liquid because of the natural evaporation, because of the wood absorption. And uh, as in the wine world, we call uh, this uh, losing la part des anges, so the angel share. Once the fermentation is complete, the beer is ready to drink. But some people in Belgium prefer a slightly fruitier taste. Down in the basement, Manu is making a creek, the Belgian name for a cherry-flavoured beer. He takes a barrel that has been fermenting for 18 months and macerates 150 kilograms of cherries in it for at least six weeks. I just took all the beer in my tank, where the cherries are, and um, I will now filter it so I can bottle it. This being Contillon, it's filtered using a machine dating from 1847 that looks like something out of Willy Wonka's factory. I will use my old filter to remove big things. So basically, piece of fruit, skins, seeds, and you see the difference between the two. This is unfiltered, you cannot see through. This one is filtered, see? can see through. Parfait. Unusually for them, these traditionalists use a machine built in the current century to bottle their beer. The creek is left for another four months to complete its fermentation in the bottle. Then it's ready to drink. Sante. Coming up. Chilling one of the hottest buildings on the planet. Crafting the best saws in the business. Engineering the ultimate microphone. And steering a ship through miles of solid ice. How do they do it? The Sydney Opera House, one of the coolest buildings in the world. There were over 200 designs submitted in the competition to design the Opera House. The runner-up looked a bit like a giant toilet roll. 
I think the Aussies got off pretty lightly. But behind the scenes, the engineers here are fighting a constant battle to stop this giant, sail-shaped structure from overheating in the baking Australian sun. And there's not an air conditioning unit in sight. How do they do it? Saturday morning in Sydney. While the locals wind down for a weekend in the sun, at the Opera House, the team are gearing up for a show in the main concert hall. Outdoor temperatures here can reach over 40 degrees Celsius, leaving facilities manager Bob Moffat feeling hot under the collar. We have to be cautious of the temperature when instruments are on stage. So the symphony, for instance, do require a, a temperature in the region of around 22.5 degrees, because if it varies from that, you find the instruments go out of tune. So the temperature and humidity in the concert hall is quite critical for musical instruments. The Opera House's roof is made from more than a million ceramic tiles. Its windows contain over 6,000 square metres of glass. Without air conditioning, it could turn into a massive greenhouse. And that's not counting the heat generated by the building's 8 million visitors. Scientists have worked out that human beings produce about 100 watts of heat energy when they're just sitting down. This means that when the main hall is full, the audience will be producing more heat than 100 convection heaters working at full blast. Most buildings hide their air conditioning units on the roof, but at the Opera House, there's nowhere to hide. So suitably, for a venue that looks like a sailing ship, the sea came to the rescue with an ingenious solution. Every second, an intake under the Opera House sucks in 205 litres of seawater, which helps cool the entire building. Project manager Simon Dwyer picks up the story. So what we've got out here is the harbour with the uh, seawater intake. The water's brought into a pipe into this room. From here, we take it through next door where we strain it. From there, it goes through into the uh, chillers, through the building, and then back out on the other side of the building. The seawater is used to cool a heat exchanger, which forms part of the building's air conditioning system. The heat exchanger is then connected to these chillers, which cool a separate supply of fresh mains water. The chilled mains water is then piped around the building to air handling units hidden in the ceiling, where it cools the hot air from the concert halls. But using seawater isn't without its pitfalls. As the seawater is pumped in from the harbour, a few unwanted clams and mussels hitch a ride. Dreamy with a white wine and cream sauce, but a nightmare for people like Brian Brown. I actually smell it's quite repugnant, but anyway. <laughs> Every few months, the little mollusks have to be muscled free from the system to ensure the heat exchanger doesn't get blocked up. In the pipes, there's another problem. The ones that carry the seawater are made from steel. And seawater does nasty stuff to steel. The answer is a piece of metal made from zinc, called an anode. Steel and seawater react, and this corrodes the steel away, but zinc is much more reactive. If you stick some sacrificial zinc in the tank, the seawater attacks that instead. There's not much left of the zinc, but the steel is saved. Back in the main concert hall, the engineers faced another challenge. The heat generated by the hall's 350-plus house lights as technical manager Philby Lewis explains. And these lights have been here pretty much from the beginning of time, so we were looking at a different form of light to replace that. Not only did the old-fashioned halogen lights give off heat, they also cost $100,000 a year to run, and they only lasted a few hundred hours before they had to be replaced. The solution was a complete overhaul of the lighting system, removing the old light fittings and installing funky new light-emitting diodes, or LEDs. The first LEDs appeared in the 60s, but they could only emit red light. They used them in those old-fashioned displays for digital clocks and electronic calculators. It wasn't until the mid-90s that they managed to make one that could emit the white light that you need to light a room. 
using LEDs cut electricity consumption by 75% and slash the heat given off by the lights so they could remove four tonnes of air conditioning ducts from the ceiling. What we did have was a system that required the equivalent of 110,000 normal house light globes. We're now down to 27,000 of them in equivalents. But the Sydney music-loving public don't really give a 4X about Philby's electricity bill. For them, it's all about the show, and that's where lighting operator Kyle Bockman comes in. Using this console, Kyle can create a kaleidoscope of colours with his fingertips. It's enabled us to change the colour of the whole room really easily. It means that any client that comes in have access to different lights, changing colour, um, you know, a really good looking show. Thanks to all this unseen engineering ingenuity, millions of visitors can keep cool whilst enjoying the hottest shows in town. If you want to chop up wood, most of us would use an axe or a chainsaw. But carpenters are more surgeons than slashers. And they prefer to use specialist saws, called back saws. These saws work like shark's teeth. A shark bites into food and then tears through the meat by shaking its head from side to side. And this is exactly how a saw rips through wood. The finest saws are handmade using designs that have been used for centuries. How do they do it? Nothing says steel like the city of Sheffield in England. They've been crafting metal blades here since the Middle Ages. Continuing that tradition today is Thomas Flynn and Company, the last traditional saw manufacturer in the UK. Christian Ellis has been sawmaking since he left school. He's now a master craftsman. Christian kicks off the process by loading coils of stainless steel onto a machine called the toother. As you might expect, it's custom built to give the saw some bite. After firing the toother up, a motor pushes the metal into the path of a triangle shaped punch. Like some kind of deranged dentist, this punch slams down onto the edge, slicing out a row of perfectly spaced teeth. It looks like a blade, but these teeth would get stuck in the wood as soon as you started sawing. It's not ready yet. Now we need to put it onto the setter. The setter is the second fiendish machine in the process. As the blade is pushed into it, it's forced into a clamp that sits between two opposing punches. These punches rhythmically smash into alternate teeth, bending them out. This means the teeth make a wider cut than the thickness of the blade, so the saw won't stick in the wood. Christian is left with a long strip of toothed metal. Perfect for sawing up a giant redwood tree, but a bit big for making your table. So he cuts it down into separate 30 centimetre long blades. However, the teeth aren't sharp enough for Christian. His next challenge is giving them more bite. This is what makes the difference between a mediocre saw and a top-notch saw. Christian places the blade in a vise with the teeth facing upwards. Then he gets busy with an angled file sharpening each and every one of them, turning each tooth into a tiny chisel. This 12-inch saw has a, approximately 150 teeth on it. The sharper the angle, the easier the saw will slice through the wood. But if they're too sharp, they will quickly wear out. So getting the angle right is a skilled job. While the saw is now razor sharp, it's flimsy and prone to buckling. The teeth need a strengthening jawbone. And that's the job of this sheet of brass. Christian slices off a length of the metal and then uses a second machine to fold it in half. He then uses something called a sawmaker's bat to gently hammer the blade into the fold. So that's the blade nearly finished. Now what a saw needs is a handle. And that's a job for David Morton. He needs to transform these lumps of maple wood into something you can grip with your fingers. This machine lends him a helping hand. 
It's called a CNC router. Part stencil, part saw, it cuts, bores and etches two perfectly shaped handles from each bit of wood. Finally, Christian slots the heel of the blade into the handle and secures it using two brass screws. And whether you're a modern-day craftsman or an original Chippendale, the finished product is a sight for sore eyes. Still to come, microphones that can pick up a careless whisper from hundreds of metres away and a titanic ship that smashes through ice. How do they do it? Every day, we're assaulted by sound. There's good sound. There's bad sound. And then there's your uncle's band. If you want to record the soundtracks and songs of our lives, you need a microphone. And this company makes one that is so sensitive it can pick up a careless whisper from hundreds of metres away. How do they do it? Vedermark, near Hanover, Germany. Sennheiser have been producing handmade recording equipment here for over 70 years. This giant factory supplies thousands of microphones a year. Used at everything from concerts to football matches. One of the first microphones was invented in 1876 by a German immigrant in the US called Emil Berliner. He was looking for a way to improve the newly invented telephone. His invention paid off because Bell bought the patent for a sum equivalent to $1.1 million today. This morning, the company are making a shotgun mic. So called because it looks a bit like a gun barrel. Used by TV and filmmakers, it's designed to pick out sounds from hundreds of meters away. The process begins behind the glass in this dust-free clean room. Here, Carmen Gomet Corbis makes the condenser capsule that turns sound waves into electrical signals. She attaches two identical perforated metal backplates either side of a thin polyester film. The film is coated in gold, so it will conduct electricity. Then she cuts round it to release a finished capsule. The thin bit of foil in the middle is known as the diaphragm. Sound waves pass through the holes in the plates, hitting the electrically charged diaphragm, making it vibrate like a drum. These vibrations cause changes in voltage across the capsule. But the changes are so minute, they can be drowned out by electrical interference. So they have to be amplified in order to produce a clean recording. That job is done by printed circuit boards, or PCBs. The first operational, mass-produced PCBs were developed during World War II. The US military used them to automatically detonate missiles. They're now found in everything from mobile phones to spaceships. Each board contains over 50 components. And it's Andrea Haas's job to check every one of them. One faulty component, and your music will sound more garden party than Madison Square Garden. Tanya Parlovich then solders the PCB into what they call the chassis and attaches the capsule holding the diaphragm. Now the components need a rugged housing to protect them. That's produced in this computer-controlled lathe. Alexander Hertel inserts a metal tube and programs the machine to cut 156 slits into the sides of the barrel. The finished housing is known as an interference tube. The idea is that the sound you want comes straight down the tube to the diaphragm. Unwanted sounds come in from the multiple slots in the side. These slots are carefully spaced out so the unwanted sounds simply cancel each other out. Then Helmut Hein uses a spray gun to give the mics a smooth finish. Finally, Birgit Hoffman slides the chassis holding the capsule and PCB into the housing, and the mic is finished. But when you're paying over one and a half thousand dollars for a bit of kit, you want to be sure it works. Inside this chamber, the mic is subjected to a range of sound frequencies to test for distortion. 
and the results are plotted on this graph. If the plot stays within the narrow band, the microphone has passed. This one sounds the business, so it's packaged up, ready to rock and roll. Just the ticket for picking up the screams on stage. But not the ones in the audience. Mid-January in Eastern Canada. Just hours ago, this mesmerising white landscape was the flowing St Lawrence River. It may be beautiful, but now it's a potentially deadly hazard to shipping. And it's vital they clear a passage through it. So when it comes to guiding giant cargo ships up a frozen river, how do they do it? There's a monster in the ice. 6,000 tonnes. 98 metres long. And they call it the Amundsen. This ship is amazing. They even put it on Canada's new $50 bill. How cool is that? This steel leviathan goes where no other vessel can, forging a path through ice over a metre thick. Icebreakers are essential to North America's economy. There are over a hundred ports and docks on the Great Lakes, and they rely on the St Lawrence as their link to the rest of the world. Today, the Amundsen is escorting the bulk carrier city of Dubrovnik up the St Lawrence River to Port Alfred. The Amundsen surveys the frozen river from sea level, whilst a helicopter gathers information from above and relays its findings to a control centre in Quebec City. Here, ice specialists like Jean-Yves Roy interpret the data and warn shipping of potential hazards. We have a, an ice chart that is uh, produced by the helicopter. We have our cameras here that look at different places. As you can see here, the ice is moving everywhere, so we don't want the ice to stop anywhere. As long as the ice is flowing steadily, then the ship should be able to pass safely through the freezing waters. But when wind and currents cause the pack ice to close up, dense ice ridges quickly build up. You don't want to sail into something like that. It's time to summon the Icebreaker. This ice-shattering hull is far stronger than any ordinary ship. Some sections are over half a metre thick and her rounded bow is designed to shove blocks of ice out of the way like a snowplow. This armour plating wouldn't be much use without serious grunt under the hood. Below deck are six huge engines. Between them, they generate 18,000 horsepower, which is transmitted to two propellers via huge rotating shafts. Powering through the ice, the engine quickly heats up. They use river water to cool it, but if the water is too cold, it could freeze in the pipes before it reaches the engine. When a river freezes, a type of slush forms called frazzle ice. It's a collection of loose, needle-shaped crystals that can block cooling systems and damage the engine. Luckily, the ship is fitted with strainer plates to sift out the ice particles. Now, the 35-man crew must find the best route through. First port of call are the eagle eyes of Alain Gariepi. As far as the ice is concerned, uh, the, the first part of our trip will get us to, to light ice, uh, very kind of thin, and then we're going to have some uh, grey ice, which is a little thicker. The thicker the ice, the harder it is to judge it from the bridge. When that happens, they have to stop and send a man overboard. His job is to measure the exact thickness of the ice by boring a hole with a giant corkscrew called an auger. He works quickly. The longer the Amundsen is stationary, the more it is at risk of becoming trapped. On the move again, it's now a race against time as the broken ice reforms. So the trailing ship must remain close to the icebreaker. But this brings its own danger. If we have a major mechanical problem, we have very, very few seconds to react, and it's the same thing for the other ship. So there's always the fear that something goes bad, and then we get rammed over by the other vessel. So that's something we, it's, a, it's uh, something we don't like to think about, but it's kind of a nightmare. 
To add to the peril, night is falling as the city of Dubrovnik follows the path cleared by the Amundsen. At 39,000 tonnes, the bulk carrier dwarfs the 6,000 tonne icebreaker in front. It must stay near to avoid the ice reforming in the Amundsen's wake. But this brings the two ships perilously close. The two vessels rely on powerful searchlights and constant radio contact to follow each other's movements. They're nearly home. Arriving in Port Alfred, the Amundsen's final task is to break the surface in the icy port. Success! They've made it through the treacherous ice to safety. The crew have earned a drink. No ice, naturally.